I'm Laura Bonatesta, and coming up on WVU News, I'll take you to the area courtroom where instead of prison sentences, people are getting second chances. I'm Sydney Wentz, and the FDA is making a major change to a life-saving drug. I'll have more on this story coming up next. I'm Aaron Dickens, and straight ahead on WVU News, a new bill signed by Governor Jim Justice could potentially solve a problem that West Virginia has been dealing with for years. Our Emmy Award-winning WVU News starts now. <laughs> West Virginia faces one of the highest rates of overdose deaths in the country, but a new bill will direct a, how a lawsuit settlement fund can help. I'm Katherine Brook. And I'm Maggie Oliverio. An overdose reversing drug has saved nearly 27,000 lives, and now the federal government is making it even easier to access. And coming up, we'll celebrate people who are staying in long-term recovery. WVU News will have those stories and more on our special edition show, Addiction in America, an ongoing epidemic. Across the country, billions of dollars are coming into local and state government to increase recovery treatment resources. That's right, Maggie. The money is coming from settlements of major lawsuits. Legislative reporter Aaron Dickens joins us now to tell us more. Aaron? Thanks, Maggie and Catherine. West Virginia has received nearly $572 million from those settlements, and the new law will make sure the money is spent on treatments we know work. Senate Bill 674 creates the West Virginia First Foundation, a nonprofit that will decide how the state will spend millions of dollars that are meant to help combat the opioid epidemic. State and local governments are receiving money now from lawsuits against opioid manufacturers, distributors, and pharmacies. Senate Bill 674 establishes the West Virginia First Foundation, a nonprofit with the governing board of 11 people who will help decide how those funds will be spent. West Virginia Delegate Minority Leader Doug Scaff says it's going to finally improve on the statewide epidemic that has been happening for years. Listen, it's a, it was a real crisis for so many years, and it still is. The opioid crisis is not going to go away. We have to do whatever we can to make people become a productive member of society. Those, these settlements are just the beginning. This bill that was passed creates a board that establishes kind of the framework of how we're going to spend that money. But the, the cool part about this bill, it requires six different regions of the state to be covered. So you can't have like all the same people from the same part of the state sitting on this board. They have to come from the regions who have been devastated the most. The foundation will get 72.5% of the state's settlement funds, while the other 24.5 would go to local governments and the remaining 3% will be held by the state in escrow. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey praised the new law and said, quote, we will now have the groundwork desperately needed to facilitate the management of the states and political subdivisions nearly $1 billion in opioid settlements. These settlements will not bring back the lives lost from the opioid epidemic, but our hope is that the money would provide significant help to those affected the most." Unquote. All 55 counties have signed the foundation's memorandum, which gives hospitals, like the one you see here, more medical assisted treatment for opioid overdoses. More than 1,400 West Virginians lost their lives to an opioid overdose last year and has cost the state an estimated $8 billion. Senator Ryan Weld says he believes the board is committed to investing the money in solutions. How do you put a cost on the deaths that West Virginia has experienced? You, you can't. This, though, is meant in part to help those who want help recover from that, but also ensure that, that we can avert from a crisis like this in the future. The bill was signed into law on March 22nd at a ceremony at the state capitol. God bless all of you. Thank you. Five of the board members will be appointed by Governor Justice and approved by the Senate. And another six will be appointed by local governments. Maggie, Catherine, back to you. Thanks, Aaron. The country saw more than 100,000 fatal overdoses in 2022. But the FDA has recently made a life-saving medication available over the counter in hopes of saving even more lives. Reporter Sydney Wentz explains. 
Naloxone is a medication administered as a nasal spray, and in March, the federal government approved its sale over the counter. Allie Rockline is a senior at WVU. Allie lost her father to an overdose her freshman year. My dad used it when I believe around eight times, and to me that even though he wasn't able to survive this disease, he was able to still have two years longer than he probably would have without Narcan. Naloxone is expected to be sold in grocery stores, pharmacies, gas stations, and even online retailers. Executive Director of West Virginia Sober Living, John Dower, says that Narcan being available over the counter is vital to keeping someone in overdose alive. So you're literally going to want to slightly tilt the person's head back, uh, put it in one nostril, push the plunger, and uh, wait the longest two to five minutes of your life to see if uh, respiration starts to increase again. According to the CDC, 81.4% of deaths in the state last year were due to an overdose. But by this summer, naloxone will be available over the counter, making it easier and more affordable for anyone to stop an overdose. For those concerned about stepping up in an emergency situation, Rockline wants you to know this. And another thing about it too is it can't harm someone, so even if you're unsure if this is an opioid overdose, it won't harm the person if it's not. West Virginia Sober Living estimates that they annually distribute 10,000 naloxone doses to the Morgantown community as a part of their Save a Life Day efforts. Sydney Wentz, WVU News, Morgantown. On the West Virginia Sober Living website listed at the bottom of your screen, you can find more information about how to access naloxone and future trainings on how to use it. Groundbreaking clinical trials happening right here in West Virginia could mean an adv a major advancement in the treatment of opioid addiction, Catherine. That's right, Maggie. The WVU Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute and WVU Medicine are conducting a first in the U.S. clinical trial that uses deep brain stimulation for treatment-resistant opioid use disorder. What you are watching here is groundbreaking. This brain surgery is the first of its kind to help people with addiction. Dr. James Mahoney works with patients participating in this groundbreaking clinical trial, but says recruiting patients with an opioid use disorder for such a serious treatment can be difficult. You know, of all aspects and what's going to be required of them, you know, it is um, a very intensive study. It's, it's brain surgery, so we need to make sure that they're very well informed and, and understand what they're, what they're getting into. This type of treatment is not just a simple visit to the doctor's office. As you can see here, the doctors are inside the patient's brain, implementing a Metronic DPS device in the addiction and reward center of the brain. The procedure has enabled three out of four patients that underwent surgery find long-term recovery. Now doctors are recruiting 20 more participants. One of the things that we've learned is it's, it's not just flipping the addiction switch. Um, it's really meant for, to help individuals um, maintain success with the standard level of care. Studies found this treatment can make people with substance use disorders less likely to relapse and have a better quality of life. Clay Marsh, Executive Dean of Health Sciences, says it's one more way WVU is a leader in the addiction science space. So we are trying to pioneer treatments and new approaches, but we're also pioneering caring and making sure that people have access to high you know, degrees of, of training and education. The clinical trial at WVU was approved by the FDA, and now more hospitals across the country can offer similar treatments to help people find long-term recovery. Research shows this type of treatment can be used for more than just opioid use disorders. In the future, the procedure can lessen people's use of alcohol, nicotine, and cocaine. For more information about the DPS treatment at WVU, Follow the link located at the bottom of your screen. 350,000 or one in five people who are incarcerated are serving time for a drug-related offense. According to the Jail and Prison Opioid Project, an estimated 65% of people in prison have had a substance use disorder. Research shows the most effective treatment for a substance use disorder includes the use of FDA-approved medications. But one national study found that the vast majority of jails and prisons do not offer this vital medical care. That's why one court in the Mountain State is focusing on helping people find long-term recovery instead of going to prison. Laura Bonatesta, Dataviz reporter, joins us from Studio B to tell us more. Laura? Thanks, Maggie. Catherine? The Northern District of West Virginia's Federal Drug Court Program is the first of its kind in the state. 
There, a community of people help those convicted of nonviolent drug offenses access the treatment they need, find employment, and even secure housing. When Cassandra Rickman first came to the federal drug court program in 2017, she never thought she'd find long-term recovery. At the time, she was struggling with severed relationships, mental health, self-worth, and a substance use disorder. But now upon her graduation, she is celebrating her accomplishments, which include reconnecting with family, obtaining joint custody of her children, and living 29 months in recovery. It takes people time to get better, and nothing, nothing that I have accomplished um, in the past year and a half, two years, would not have been possible if somebody would not have given me another chance. So, and I just want people to remember that. People are gonna mess up, people are gonna get sick, um, they're gonna make mistakes, but that doesn't mean it's over for them. The community-based team helps participants meet basic needs, get treatment, and address underlying factors that may lead to substance use. And people who complete the program can receive shorter sentences, reduced charges, or dismissal of their indictment, which federal judge Michael Alloy says gives people like Rickman both hope and second chances. And it's an interaction to uh, change someone's life for the better. Um, and when you do that, and they go out and they become good citizens and good mothers and good daughters and good granddaughters and then do the work that she does, the recovery work and the lives that she affects, I mean, what is a greater result than that? More than 25 people have graduated from Judge Alloy's program. And for some, it's marked the beginning of both long-term recovery and the chance to give back to their community. That's the case for Rickman who now works as a peer recovery coach with WVU Medicine's Healthy Minds. It changes people's lives, and the community needs sick people to get better instead of punishing sick people, Do you know, and sending them to prison. You know, we can, these people can recover, and they can become contributing members of society, and they can help someone else get better. And in the future, Rickman plans to purchase a home, spend more time with her family, and continue to work on her recovery. Recovery from addiction is possible. There are more than 25 million people in the U.S. in long-term recovery today. If you or someone you know is looking for treatment, call the free and confidential treatment referral hotline or visit the link at the bottom of your screen. Maggie, back to you at the Waterfront Studio. Thanks, Laura. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that is 100 times stronger than morphine. It's a medication that's prescribed in hospitals, but illicitly manufactured fentanyl sometimes mixed with street drugs, can be fatal, and in 2020, resulting in the death of more than 53,000 Americans. Lauren Cole was one of them, but today, her family has started a recovery center in her honor. Lauren Cole passed away due to a fentanyl poisoning in 2020. She'd been diagnosed with an opioid use disorder, but like so many people who have died in the U.S. due to an accidental overdose, Lauren didn't know she was being exposed to fentanyl. Mackenzie Marara was one of Lauren's best friends. Everybody that knows Lauren said how hilarious she was. Um, I have stories for days, like she was just the funniest person and she was just such a light. Anytime she was around, like, you were just smiling no matter what. Before she passed, Lauren told her dad, Mike Cole, it was her dream to create a place for those struggling. Cole was able to make his daughter's dream a reality and founded Lauren's Wish. The facility offers housing and access to individual and group counseling in rooms like this one. So far, Lauren's Wish has helped over 100 people in Morgantown. Lynn Murray is the program director and has been specializing in coaching in the field of addiction for 15 years. You, you do the support part. That is your job. As, as, but understand this here. It's their walk. It's not your walk. It's theirs. Nobody else's but theirs. As long as they do the right thing, it, it's a tough walk. It's, it's a tough, tough walk. Uh, but it can happen. Live an example. Cole says his Lauren was more than her disease, and so are the millions of other people who have a substance use disorder. And I think it's a stigma around it. You know, people still aren't willing to talk about it, but reality is it's in one out of every 2.7 families, so we need to talk about it. And the rate that it's taking our youth, uh, we're in jeopardy of lo losing a generation if we don't react quickly. Lauren's Wish opened in October, and their goal is to open several more centers across the state. 
If you or someone you know is struggling with a substance use disorder in Morgantown, you can contact Lauren's Wish at the number or link listed at the bottom of your screen. Coming up, if you have a teenager who vapes, you should be concerned about their exposure to more than just nicotine. In 2021, 75% of college students who use tobacco products reported using e-cigarettes or vapes sold at shops like this. I'm Kayla Riccatelli, and coming up on WVU News, I'll tell you how vaping can affect your health. Coming up on WVU News, I'm Zach DeLuca, and I'll take you to an event on campus where students are celebrating recovery with outdoor activities like yoga. Catherine, along with New York and California, West Virginia is among several states cracking down on the illegal sales of e-cigarette products to young people. Maggie, vaping used to be marketed as a product that could help you quit smoking, but new research shows it could be just as harmful to your health. Social Square reporter Kaylee Riccatelli is here to tell us more. Kaylee? Thanks, Catherine. Maggie? Vaping among teenagers has grown by close to 2,000% in the U.S. since last year. In 2022, the most common reason given by middle and high schoolers as to why they started vaping was because a friend tried it. Caitlin Pearson, a WVU student, says she started vaping in high school because of the surrounding culture. It was more of like a social thing. Like it was just, I was around it all the time and I just wanted to try it. Like just everyone did it. While vaping at any age can be harmful, nicotine use before the age of 26 can affect brain development. Dr. Ron Stallings, an internal medicine doctor and former senator from Madison, West Virginia, says this can make young people more susceptible to addiction. Uh, the studies show that uh, brains earlier than like 26 years old are certainly more uh, apt uh, to be addicted. There's the decision-making the risk benefit uh, is just not there yet. Nicotine content and concentration of e-cigarette products can vary depending on brand. And a 2016 study showed that 51% of labels on e-cigarette products did not list the correct level of nicotine. This is Abuse, a common e-cigarette device among teens and young adults. And according to Views's website, one Views pod can contain the same amount of nicotine as up to 20 cigarettes. But nicotine isn't the only ingredient you should be on the lookout for. The liquid in e-cigarettes does contain water and nicotine, but it can also contain heavy metals like tin and lead, ultrafine particles, and cancer-causing flavoring chemicals. The state of West Virginia reached a $7.9 million settlement with Juul for unfair and deceptive advertising that was geared toward underage people and for lying about the nicotine content of their products. If you or someone you know needs help with vaping, call the West Virginia Tobacco Quit Line number at the bottom of your screen. Catherine and Maggie, back to you. Thanks, Kaylee. Catherine, playing video games can actually improve our mental well-being. In fact, studies show it is an effective stress reliever for some. But too much of it could affect how your brain functions, turning into a less than healthy habit. Nate Height reports. Devin Lionheart is a member of WVU's eSports team, and he says he struggled with excessive video game playing in his life. No one was really telling me that what I had was a disease. They were just telling me that what I was doing was unhealthy and that I should try to manage it like I manage everything else in my life, you know. Video games are fun and they're great, but you, you really shouldn't, you know, just use it as an escape. Lionheart says he was using video games as a way to cope with his temper. And while he wasn't diagnosed with an addiction to playing video games, he says there was a time when he felt negative impacts. Researchers have estimated that video game addiction has affected between 1.7% and 10% of the U.S. population. But like many other addictions, there are ways to help. The Cleveland Clinic describes symptoms as poor performance at work or school, 
an inability to reduce time playing video games, or a need to spend more time to get the same satisfaction. Molly Robinson works in WVU's Department of Behavioral Medicine and Psychiatry. She says that behavioral addictions, like one with video games, can be helped like any other addiction. Because the behavioral addiction follows that same mesolimbic pathway as our substance use disorders, we do have certain like behavioral therapies and medication treatments that we can use that would work for both types of addictions. According to a study in 2020, nearly 58% of Americans play video games. Nice. And WebMD states that video games can be good mental stimulation and a stress reliever. Lionheart has some advice for people who are worried about how much they're playing video games. I would say that I've been through a lot of the same. I know what it's like, um, but what you can, you, you have a lot of choices and you have a lot of things you can do to make it better. And the, the reason why I am where I am now is because I chose to take my love and passion for video games and try to push it in my career. He says now that he knows the warning signs, he knows when to ask for help. Nate Hyde, oh WVU this News, is, is Morgantown. According to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, engaging in social activities can help people in recovery maintain their sobriety because they join a community of support. And Catherine, an organization here at WVU has created that community for people in recovery and their allies. Reporter Zach DeLuca has more. Whether tie-dyeing shirts or participating in outdoor yoga, Students across campus showed their support for WVU Collegiate Recovery during this week-long recognition. This year marks the 13th since the founding of the Association of Recovery in Higher Education. And Director Olivia Pape couldn't be more proud to be involved. I love the energy of the students. I love getting to play a small role in helping people. You know, whether that's just find support that they need, come back to school, build a sense of community, find their purpose while they're here. Um, any little piece I get to play in that is super rewarding. WVU's Collegiate Recovery team is made up of students like Jeffrey Seabury, who is the graduate assistant for the program. Whether the members came for recovery or to be recovery allies, everyone feels the camaraderie this program creates. I think that is like the, the most important part of the Collegiate Recovery program is the community that we offer. Um, you know, whether you're in recovery or not, um, you know, you can come and get plugged in and, you know, have fun and meet other students and, you know, just really enjoy your time on campus. WVU Collegiate Recovery is one of 152 college recovery programs nationwide, according to the Association of Recovery in Higher Education. This network of support and recognition means PAPE is hopeful for how the program can reach more people in the future. This is the first semester, really, since I've been in this role for three years that when my students go out doing tabling outreach and they say, hey, have you heard of collegiate recovery? The majority of people say, yes, I have. For those looking for support in their recovery on campus, you can visit Serenity Place downtown. Zach DeLuca, WVU News, Morgantown. The WVU Collegiate Recovery Program supports students in recovery by promoting a healthy, balanced, and meaningful life. For more information, visit the link listed at the bottom of your screen. Coming up after the break, we learn more about a hobby associated with sports that can turn into something much more serious for some. I'm Sean Loudon. Do you enjoy sports gambling? Coming up on WVU News, I'll tell you how a hobby could turn into an addiction. Americans have wagered over $200 million on sports bets since 2018. I'm Andrew Nagowski, and I'll show you how a device like this one can possibly turn a hobby into an addiction. At WVU, an education is more than just a diploma. It's about the journey along the way. From your first week of class to your last, we offer a college experience with top-tier R1 research, one-of-a-kind traditions, and top-ranked academic programs, all designed to land you your dream job and not break the bank. Here, we reward hard work and work hard to support you because we're all in this together. This is WVU. This is home. And 
2018, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down a federal ban on sports betting, and since tens of millions of Americans have started regularly gambling on anything from NCAA basketball to PGA Tour matches. That's right, Maggie. More than 50 million Americans have bet on the outcome of the Super Bowl this year alone. But for people whose hobby becomes more than just a pastime, there are a few resources to help. Our sports reporters Sean Loudermilk and Andrew Nagowski are here with team coverage of sports betting in West Virginia. Thanks, Catherine. Maggie, West Virginia became the fifth state to legalize sports betting back in 2018. And since, 28 other states have joined it. That's right, Andrew. Retail, mobile, and online sports betting is all legal here in West Virginia, and it's generated more than $150 in revenue for the state. The legal age to gamble in West Virginia is 18, but because most sports betting takes place online, studies show 5% of young people ages 11 to 17 meet at least one criteria for a diagnosed sports betting addiction. But the risk is highest for men ages 18 to 24. I caught up with a few of the people in this at-risk group to learn more. You know what to do. Roughly 6% of college students who gamble develop a gambling problem. And in most states, prevention and treatment services, particularly for youth, are insufficiently funded or non-existent. Jacob Janowski, a graduate student at WBU, says that he believes students start betting for fun, but it can become much more. I think it's a thrilling thing. I mean, you're getting emotionally invested into something you may not otherwise be invested in, but since you put down money, it becomes something you might want to be invested in. Sports betting is one of the most frequently used forms of gambling for college students. Researchers say nearly 67% of all college students bet on sports, with 1 in 20 students meeting the criteria for compulsive gambling. Lauren Delo, a student athlete here at WVU, says that it's nearly impossible for students to escape advertisements promoting gambling. I think um, ads are definitely making college students gamble more. There are so many ads there and they're specifically targeting college students because college students are young and they're susceptible. And it's Obama Young and a goal is here. Sports gambling can take a different form as well. In several different competitive online sports games, such as Madden, FIFA, and NBA 2K, a concept known as loot boxes exists, urging players to spend extra money on virtual currency for the chance to earn better players. Players can spend their virtual currency on packs, similar to real life trading cards. Like they say, life is like a box of chocolates, you never know what you're going to get. And the same applies here. The odds to get some of the best players in these games can be as low as 1%. A report from the Gambling Commission discovered that 13% of teenagers from ages 11 to 16 had played these types of video games online, with 31% of them purchasing these loot boxes. A 2018 survey of over 7,000 gamers found that the more money somebody spent on these loot boxes, the higher their likelihood to become a problem gambler. But how do you know when sports betting transitions from a hobby to an addiction? Our team coverage continues by learning more about the disease and its warning signs. Roughly 6.6 .6 million people have a gambling addiction. That means they can't stop despite the negative consequences. Dr. Maria Shakasova, a behavioral neuroscientist at the WVU Department of Psychology, says there are several warning signs. So those would be things like um, loss chasing or um, escalating uh, betting or preoccupation with gambling, kind of, you know, um, it taking over a person's life, um, uh, spending more than a person can, can really afford to lose. Disordered gambling can deplete people's savings, damage personal relationships, and result in troubles at work. Thanks to the advent of online sports betting, it is incredibly easy to place a sports bet. All you have to do is go to a sports betting website like DraftKings and put in your information like your name, address, and social security number. Then you're just a few clicks away from making a bet. Sherkasova says that ease of access has increased the number of people who are regularly gambling. But if it becomes more than a hobby, Sherkasova says there are treatments available. So locally, for example, uh, in Morgantown, there is Problem Gambling Health Network of uh, West Virginia. Um, I guess that, that's more in the state. So there's a 1-800 number that the people can call if they're experiencing problems. Um, so this organization organizes a support group 
um, in Morgantown. She encourages people to seek out help if they need it. Call the number at the bottom of your screen if you or someone you know is looking for help for a gambling addiction. Maggie, Catherine, back to you. Thanks, Andrew. Sean, that's going to do it for this special edition of WVU News. I'm Catherine Brute. And I'm Maggie Oliverio. You can visit us online on our website or watch our shows on YouTube. And please, follow us and our reporters on Twitter. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.